Good morning, everyone. It is Thursday, January 20th. Welcome into the morning medical update. Thank you so much for joining us today on Facebook and on YouTube. Two metro Kansas counties either have the lowest number of people vaccinated in the metro or are battling high positivity rates. Either way, the numbers aren't great for Johnson and Wyandotte County. Joining us this morning to talk more about that is Dr. Alan Grenier. He's the medical officer for the Unified, Unified Government Public Health Department. And Johnson County Public Health Officer Dr. Joseph Lamaster is hopefully going to be joining us here any moment. So we will wait for him. Good morning to you. Good morning. Lots to talk about. I will get with you here in just a moment. You guys are going to kind of help us break down your counties by the numbers, what it means now, what it could mean later. Yep. Um, so make sure to get your questions sent into us on YouTube, Facebook, and on the Medical News Network. You can find links right there on your screen. But first, let's go to our COVID count, Dr. Dana Hawkinson. Good morning yeah. to you. Hi. Uh, numbers are holding fairly steady, 100 active infections at this point in time, 21 in the ICU, but again, a large proportion on the ventilator, 15 on the ventilator. Uh, 78 additional patients in that recovery period, so a total of 100 in 96 patients. Uh, we did have one inpatient death uh, on the 19th, so in the last 24 hours as well. So we still have a high rate of mor uh, mortality, unfortunately, for the month of January. And I would just like to say, Dr. Greiner, you did excellent on your commercials. Uh, I think you're a great um, a representative uh, for public health in Wyandotte County. I wish we had that. So this is a, a, a campaign you did with KDHE. Yeah. You were one of, I think, 10 or 12 different folks that yep. had different stories to share about their experience with COVID. And what was your message? Really just that I think with all the data we have, we, we know these vaccines are very safe and very effective, and, and we want to motivate people to, to get them. I had a story about about a patient of mine that's a longtime patient of mine here. In fact, saw lots of physicians here and was a great guy and we lost him to COVID last year. And, and I wanted to share that because it was, you know, emotionally impactful to me. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, we need to keep working on this. It's tough and you're a physician and a lot of these folks were just um, regular folks who have had, you know, rough times, but you know, you're a physician, you, you suffer just like the rest of us watching people lose their lives to COVID. Yeah, so. yep. Yep, everybody's had stories like that. I think around around here, and and you know we do have we have patients that you know that have a lot of problems, but they they still have great quality of life. I think because because our system keeps them keeps them rolling and 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 out there doing the things they want to do, which is the goal. And and to lose people to this disease is just it's it's sad and it's been impactful for everybody. I mean, I know the nurses have suffered, and I know physicians have. We've all seen seen sad stuff. So, well, thank you for that segue over into what I want to talk about first before we get to our topic. The stress on the health system here and across the region has been made clear. We talk about it every single day. We begin this morning with a look inside our emergency department, where staff work constant and tirelessly to make sure whoever comes through those doors are cared for. Last night, um, when I was working, we had probably five or six patients that we sent to the ICU over my shift. You also still have the patients that are in the waiting room, um, which can be anywhere from five patients to, I've seen as high as 52. Being a hospital with 55 beds, and then having just as many patients waiting as there are in the department. I hear we need an IV. Are you okay if I look with my machine? Our beds are at capacity, staffing is at capacity. This is KU, go ahead. And every day I look at that board. Do you need an escort? Typically on average, 10 to 12 hospitals in the city are on high volume. All right, we'll see you on arrival, KU clear. They are notifying patients that are gonna be arriving that they're gonna probably end up in triage. When you come in by ambulance, that doesn't guarantee that you're getting a bed because we still have to take the sickest patients first. Morgan, you're doing okay? And while yes, a lot of it is COVID, there is also a lot of just sick patients in general. Nicole, do you need anything? Staff has been feeling it for sure. Um, I've been a nurse down here for five years and we are probably the busiest that I've ever seen us. Um, so if patients are here solely for MAB, please let Heidi or I know what keeps me coming back. In triage, Casey is at T1, the team. Allie and Nick are in the front hall. Um, I really enjoy the team that we have down here. Thank you all. Knowing that I get to show up and be here for these nurses um, and that they do the same, um, we have a really good team down here in the emergency department and I feel very grateful to be a part of it and that I get to be there to support them. 
uh, uh, Dr. Joseph Lavaster, Johnson County Public Health Officer. How are you today? Good, very, very good. Good to meet you. Good to have good you. To so, just you, you see this. Um, you work your peers, your doctor friends that that tell you what's going on inside these emergency departments. I mean, we know they're down there hustling it all the time outside of COVID. But then you add COVID. Um, just kind of, what's your response and your reaction when you see these folks down here? Um, just making it work. It seems like they're always just making it work, getting patients in and out and where they need to be. Your thoughts, Dr. LeMaster? Well, I think that the main thing that we are seeing and that um, is an encouragement to us is that as we are getting to the peak of this current uh, surge, uh, the Omicron surge, we're starting to see some of our staff come back. Uh, and that is a great encouragement because as the numbers have picked up in the hospital, uh, we've had the greatest concern that we might not be able to care for everybody with the number of staff that were out sick as well. If the number of staff begin to come back, then our capacity to be able to take care of the increasing numbers uh, that we'll see both in the outpatient setting and in the inpatient setting is we have a lot more encouragement and a lot more hope. And that's just something that I don't think we have seen. You know, we talked about this influx of patients, but now you add the staffing issue. And again, these aren't just staff that are out because they have COVID. I mean, these are staff that have to stay home with kids who are sick with COVID or kids yes. who have schools that are canceled. I mean, it's it's just a very compound problem. Dr. Yeah. Greiner? Yeah. I mean, I, I really commend the different staff, but both here at, the, at our health system, but really all across the country. I think people's ability to be flexible and, and put their career as sort of a calling, you know, out there on their sleeve and, and take take the, the tough pieces of this. I mean, my, my heart goes out to to the nursing staff and the respiratory therapists and the, and the nurse aides. You know, in the last month, I think the things people have gone through have been really incredibly tough. And, and we're, we're almost at two years of this kind of strain on people. And they're still doing the same work day in and day out. And that's why we, we, we take folks behind the scenes so that they know. I think when we call 911 or we go to an emergency room, we just assume that's where we can always get help and staff is always there ready ready to make sure our needs are met. But it, it's just, it's a really rough time for everyone. Um, I wanna talk with both of you about, about the numbers. Um, Dr. Greiner, let's just talk about how many cases um, are high in Wyandotte County right now. What are you seeing? up down and very, where are very, we going? very high we're we're about the same level as as we've been here for for a couple of weeks i think yesterday we had our seven day average was was 483 cases total so the, these numbers are as high as we've been throughout the pandemic we we can't keep up with contact tracing i think all of us yes. in the public health realm and at the state level at the kansas department of health and environment no no one can keep up with that contact tracing and making those calls to people now so we're trying to do do education other ways our percent positivity, we're putting it out there in, in two numbers now, a, a sort of traditional number that's that's 33% of all the tests that get done are positive. And then for those that have never had COVID in the past, we have that number out there too, which is which has been in the high 60s to even 70% of, of people who haven't been tested before. So back to the contact tracing, is that what's adding, do you think, on top of just the lack of vaccination, positivity rates? not being able to contact people or is contact tracing just kind of a thing of the past you're on your own well it's it's becoming that way the sad thing is there's so many things we can do though when we get a hold of somebody we can do a lot of education on the phone with them and we we can also do things like we've been providing them letters i think they have a johnson county too where they if they need something for their employer we can literally provide that to them so if they can't get into their doctor's office in a week They've got that so they, they can take the time off work and have, have an excuse to do that. So you look at this as an opportunity to reach someone, yeah. to actually have contact yeah. with them, to educate, get them maybe vaccinated. Yeah. Or so when this surge started, we tried to sort of prioritize some people that we would, we would if we couldn't keep up with the hundreds of cases a day, we would at least try to get a hold of 50 people who we thought were the highest risk people, the older people, the people who, maybe the middle-aged people who we know work out in the public sector. We want them to, if they're symptomatic, to take that time off of work. So we wanted to do that education. Let's talk about vaccines. How are we doing on the vaccine front? Oh, well, not not so great in Wyandotte. We've we've really had a struggle and we've we've done all sorts of things to try to get around that, but we're, we're only at about 58% for those that have had a first dose of vaccine, about 49% of those that have been what we considered fully fully vaccinated. But for boosters, we're only at about 16% as a county, at, which is which is really low. And then in the five to 17 year olds, we're, we're lagging too. I think we have 40% of those with a first shot, but we've got to get second shots. And we know 
I'm sure Dr. Hawkinson's talked about it before. We've got to get boosters into arms to, to protect people as much as we can. Doc Hawk, why do we see such low booster numbers? We, we see 50, what, 57 percent about you said? With, what, with, with a first shot, 58 percent. Yeah, but only 16 with 16 that, first with that booster. booster. I mean, let's just talk about the booster effect. Yeah. Um, you know, why are we seeing so few or why is there such a smaller percentage? I mean, I think there are a variety of reasons. For the same reasons maybe people were hesitant, there's just a variety of reasons. Maybe they just haven't uh, prioritized the time to go get that. Uh, certainly that, that can be. Uh, maybe they've had the infection before and feel that with their vaccination and, and a previous infection, which we know does provide pretty good immunity, uh, they don't have to go get it. But there probably are a lot of those people who have gotten the first two doses and haven't, uh, haven't come back for that additional dose. And that additional dose really is key just because of the time point that you are from that second dose, which within that time really allows for that immune system to, to further develop. And then that, that additional dose, that third dose at that six months or more, really helps to provide that boost to that, that full immunity. So it's unclear exactly why. I'm sure there are a variety of reasons. Dr. Lamaster, you're up next. Okay, let's talk some numbers in Johnson okay. County. What can you tell us? Well, I think that the numbers are very much similar to what we've seen in, in Wyandotte County, except that the population, of course, is four times that. So we also have seen uh, record numbers of cases that are, are really astonishing. Uh, the case rates, our, our case diagnosis rates, about four times that which we saw um, at any other point during the pandemic. It's, it's been really astonishing. And, and while there seems to be, if you look at our county uh, website, there seems to be just a tiny little uh, blip coming maybe down. We may be just at that point. I think that there's some evidence uh, as, uh, that, that from our wastewater monitoring that we're starting to see some decreases in the, in the wastewater, which previously have predicted a decrease in, in case numbers. So we are hopeful that we'll start to see some of that come down. Uh, but but still the numbers are astonishingly high. And I think the thing that is, has been, um, that we have to be careful about at this point is as we start to see the numbers come down, um, we, we don't yet know what we're going to be facing in terms of the hospital systems and, our, and, and the number of people that are gonna need to be hospitalized. Um, we too are in the same situation uh, in terms of vaccination numbers. We're, we're still very much behind where we think we need to be. The biggest concern, of course, are in the youngest group of people who have the lowest uh, rates of vaccination. What uh, age group is that? Are we talking I, kids uh, or teens? 17 and 17 unders and the, and the kids as well. If you, if you look at the rates of vaccination across every age group, it's the highest in the oldest age group, and it goes down, 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 all the way down to the youngest age group. Some of that has had to do with the timing effect, right? It, it did, they didn't get started un, until later. Uh, but we haven't seen um, the same rate of increase in the kids that we did uh, with, with uh, some of the uh, older groups. And so at this point, we feel like that pretty much everybody who has had an, has had an opportunity to get vaccinated so now the issue is, will you choose to get vaccinated? That was will my you next, do it? That was my next question, because I feel like you both sound like a broken record from the last time you were yeah. on here, and I'm not happy about that. But yeah. why do you think it's like been a stall out? What is that from what you see or what you hear or what you know of these folks yeah. living in these areas? Well, there are two things going on. One is that there is a, a certain amount of vaccine hesitancy happening um, there, are, there is a group of people who will never get vaccinated no matter what you do. They've decided they either don't believe in vaccines generally or they don't believe in this vaccine for whatever reason, for whatever information they've heard or they've believed and they've, they've adopted that. Um, but there are all, there's also still um, groups of people who haven't received, who haven't, we haven't reached. Some of our more under-resourced under uh, minority populations, underrepresented minority populations, we still are trying to get the word out so that if there's any misinformation or there's any uh, lack of information about it, the hesitancy it doesn't necessarily work in each group in the same way. Um, right, that, that makes sense. What are you seeing? Because you, you yeah. have a lot of unreached groups. We, we do, and, and I think we've got a lot of people with complicated lives, you know, in, in Wyandotte, we have a lot of, of families where the, the parents are working two, three jobs. They, they have trouble getting to our, our sites, you know, so we've changed the hours. We've done a lot of weekend things. That's, that seems to be successful. We've done, as, as I think we've talked about before in here, we've done a lot of things with churches. That's, that's going to continue for us because people trust those, 
those institutions. Um, but but people's concerns are all over the map. Some of them, it, it, you know, it, it's it's not terrible that people have concerns and want to be safe mm -hmm. with these things. But but it's all about balancing. And I think we've we've come to a time where there's so much information out there. And and I I always encourage people to do their own research, right? People talk about doing that. Find find out information, but there's so much information out there. It's really hard to process. And we do have experts like Dr. Hawkinson who that, that you know he's going through information all the time to figure out what medicines work for infectious diseases. And it's a complicated process. There's tons out there in the scientific literature, let alone everything else on the internet. So I think we you know we have to find ways to to get on the side of where the authority is and 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 make smart decisions that are going to keep people healthy. It's it's tough, but we've got to keep trying. And you, I think I like that you said people have complicated lives. It isn't just everybody's an anti-vaxxer. Right. Or, yeah. or uneducated or doesn't get it or they're dumb. This is about, you're right, there are people who say, I don't want to get the booster because I have to work. I don't want to be out of work a day. I can't. Right. I can't yeah. risk yeah. that. Um, I just think it's important to remember that. I think it's we kind of build that compassion back into it to try to understand and meet people at whatever level they're at, right? Yeah. It's interesting that you say that. I had a conversation actually with my brother-in-law this weekend, that same conversation, and he was saying, I can't afford to be out of work for two days because if the, you know, if the vaccine makes me sick. And I said, well, do the math. You know, <laughs> how long are you gonna be out of work if you actually get COVID, if you actually get Omicron? And he had a friend who'd been out for about six days and was in bed for six days. So that even if you, even if you factor in the possibility that you might be out for a day or even two days, what's it going to be, look like if you actually get uh, COVID and you're quite sick? So you could be out for a, a much longer period than that. Why are people so darn hard on the vaccine, but they're not as hard on COVID? It's like... Yeah, I mean, I've talked to some rural colleagues who are doing monoclonal antibody infusions, right? And, and this is before our latest shortage on those. But but they'd have people who are very anti-vaccine and then they'd get sick with COVID and want to come in and get a monoclonal antibody treatment in the emergent, small hospital emergency room. And it's like, okay, how is your theory about science and safety different with a vaccine versus an infusion of this product that was developed probably by the same researchers that have been involved in developing? It's, it's tough. We don't want to blame these people. We, ca we got to still be on their side. Mm -hmm. I always think of it like, I'm sure Dr. Will Masters had this experience too. If you have a new diabetic, they, they sometimes don't want to accept that and, and get on insulin shots, right? Mm -hmm. But we can't blame them for that. If it takes us two or three months to get them on the right medicines and convince to do that, we have to be, it's, it's our job to be on their side and be open-minded about it. Absolutely. You agree, Dr. LeMaster? Yeah, absolutely. I think that all of this is an ongoing conversation, which is one of the reasons why we've pressed so hard and why it's now possible for you to get, in most places, to get a vaccine with your own primary care doctor mm -hmm. in your own clinic. You have an ongoing relationship yes. with that doctor. You trust that doctor. Ask that doctor, what should I do? That doctor probably can get you boosted, probably can get that vaccine right in your own clinic. If they can't, then they'll have something set up where you can get it. So, you know, relationships with our own okay. doctors are, are really important. And we, of course, you know, in, our, in, the, in the KU health system, we have a very robust system of primary care and, and we try and make it possible for you to get in to see your own doctor that same day if you need to. That bringing that comfort, that reassurance. Yes. But yeah, it's all about reaching the unreachable. Okay, so I want to ask you about something, uh, Dr. Lamaster, in Johnson County, those three cities that put the mask mandate back in, yeah. Mission, Roland Park, and uh, Prairie Village. Yes. Does that move the needle? How much does that help? What does that tell you? Yeah, I think it's extremely good to do this. We want to continue to encourage mask wearing in every situation that we can because we know that it works. We know that it cuts back transmission. We continue to encourage everyone to be wearing masks in indoor situations where they're with groups of people, all of the things that we've been saying that were right the way through the pandemic. In Johnson County, we've also uh, stepped up our recommendations for people to use uh, more than just a single cloth mask, if they can, to use uh, double masks, uh, because that also has, we believe, at least uh, as much uh, effectiveness as what we've had before. Maybe it will have um, uh, some additional uh, benefit. Uh, at the county level, we haven't put mandates in. We've uh, given, we've deferred to um, the school districts to do that and to the local municipalities. Part of that has to do with the enforcement issues mm -hmm. uh, of, of how to make that actually work. Uh, but the most important thing I think that people can do still, 
uh, is going to be getting that booster. Uh, the booster, probably in my mind, has more effect at this point than any of the, of the other things that we could do because Omicron is so highly transmissible. Um, but certainly, I would encourage people not to be gathering unmasked in any indoor type of gatherings at all. That really should not happen, any indoor setting, I think. Okay, we hear you on that. <laughs> Boosters are key. Um, I want to go back to masking. What's masking like in, in your counties? And I live in Johnson County, and I was yeah. been very impressed in some areas that I went somewhere yesterday, and it scared me, so I left. <laughs> so yes. I, I get like, wow, really proud of you folks. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, you're not doing it right. So tell yeah. me, just kind of paint the picture of what, what masking looks like in each county. Yeah. I mean, we had a mandate for a little bit longer in Wyandotte County. How much that helped us, I'm, I'm not sure. We had problems with enforcement, too. But, I, you know, I do think it's it's one of those things where you kind of need societal buy-in. It's, you know, I, I keep comparing it to stopping at red lights or not taking a right turn on a red light. Mm -hmm. if, if there's a sign that says you shouldn't, it's like uh. we're trusting people to do this so they don't get in car wrecks, you know. And we need to buy in on the mass thing, especially when we're having surges like this, as Dr. Master says, any indoor space where, where you're around other people, you should, you should have a mask. And I agree with him, a high quality mask, like either double masking with a cloth and a, you know, a disposable surgical mask or a KN95 or, or something like that is, is valuable at this point in time when we're in this, this biggest surge. I'm glad you brought that up. We're doing Masking 101 right here on the show tomorrow. Yeah. So yeah. we'll be talking about that. We're kind of going back to basics because I think people mm. are listening, maybe people who weren't wearing a mask before saying, hey, I think I want to jump on that train. And we want to make sure they're buying the right ones and wearing them the right way. So we're happy to go back and do that. But you meant it's it's not just the mandate, it's the enforcing. Yeah. That's yeah. the challenge, right? Yeah, right. that's right. I mean, you know, you, it, you have to think about the fact that if you put a mandate legally in place, and then there are infractions of that that you have to have the sheriff's department or the police department going out and issuing citations. Uh, they've got a lot of staff that are out also. They've got the same sort of situation that we've got in, other situa in, in, in every other sector. I think what we've tried to do in every way that we could was to encourage people to do the right thing, to, in to appeal to people's sensibilities to the fact that they're uh, Adults that they're educated people that they or that they know how to uh, protect themselves, but we continue to see, especially in uh, in retail sorts of situations, in restaurants, in churches, people continuing to gather uh, in in large groups, and that's because they don't. There is no mandate against it. They have the freedom to do that, but that doesn't mean that it's wise to do it. Just well, and when we had a it. mandate, it made, it felt better when just. We had to, but now you're happy to make that decision on your own. No one's telling you to do it. You just have right. to go, oh, aha, I need to wear a mask. Yes. And, and there are places where it's, be, as you know, it's become very politicized yeah. across the state. The, the rural areas, it's it's a big issue where people are, they're still feeling like it's it's some freedom issue. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you know, think about this place, this hospital. People wear masks when they come here. And, and the surgeons, when they operate in the operating room, the surgeons have been wearing masks for decades, right? You, you don't find surgeons who start talking about their liberty and their freedom. <laughs> They're trying to protect their patients in the operating room. And themselves, room. yeah, And you're, when you walk in this place, you know there's cancer patients who are yeah. immunocompromised here. Yeah. You're, you're, everybody's wearing a mask in this building. So, so there are environments we can do it, especially, you know, when there's a surge going on, we all have to... We have to get on board. It's very similar to like smoky, indoor smoking bans when they first started mm -hmm. a, cu a couple decades ago. That that took a while for everybody to get on the same page. Oh, it still blows my mind. I used to wait tables and I thought, oh my gosh, I used to have to ask people, do you want smoking or non-smoking? Yeah. And I'd be moseying through and I thought, wow, we've come a long way in a time you thought, wow, this is how it used to be. Not the case anymore. Yep. You bring up, you know, being politicized. So I have to ask you because we had uh, Mayor Quentin Lucas on yesterday. So, mm. and that question is asked, Mr. Mayor, why can't you just put the mask mandates back in place and, and you know, wave your magic wand? Tell us a little bit about how you two on the county level work your way up to be have your voices heard, have your people's voices heard <laughs> as you lower your head. Tell us how <laughs> how easy that is, Dr. Lavasse. Yeah, well, not very. <laughs> right. I think the thing is that we, uh, at least in Johnson County, I feel like we've had a better situation than many counties had across the state because we have um, we have a group of commissioners who, uh, in the main, uh, are, are are working very closely with us, listening to us, talking to us. Um, we, we consult with them regularly. We have county managers who are very reasonable and work with us. So I think that we've been able to have really, um, really 
good conversations right the way along. You know, even when I had the authority to pass uh, public health orders that was independent of them, I always consulted with them in everything that I did. We never did anything any independently ever. Um, but I think that on the other hand, they also are having a lot of voices coming towards them, mm -hmm. many of which uh, are tired of the mass or, th or see them as, as harmful. And so it's hard for them to balance all of those things and, you know, the, the voices of the people that are in their ear. Remember yeah. that now we're in a situation where the boards of county commissioners actually have the final authority to make to pass the public health orders. It's not in the hands of the public health officers anymore. The commissions do that. Um, and so it's, it's really just a case of trying to make, uh, trying to bring the data, trying to bring the science that is most, it's been emerging, making an argument for those things which are reasonable to do and which we think are going to make a difference. I think that the point right now, though, that, that I'm mostly trying to talk uh, to them about is uh, for us to be looking very carefully at all of what we need to do to support the hospitals going forward into these next few weeks. I think that this is really a key time for us mm -hmm. to be looking at, uh, at what we've got in place in terms of our, our staff, or our infrastructure, for uh, the hospitals to be able to make sure that everything is ready if we start to see these numbers go up. And, and, and to me, that's the more important thing for us to be doing at a county level at this moment. Um, you know, I think that it'd be great to pass mass mandates, but when, you're, you know, when we've got the numbers that, are, that we've been seeing recently uh, in terms of cases, and we know that that is always followed at two to three weeks later by a rise in the number of hospitalizations. To me, it, is, it behooves us more to put some emphasis on uh, making sure we've got everything in place to be able to, to manage that when it hits us. What are your thoughts, Dr. Greiner, on that? You, you know, I, these things are, it's a balance, and this has always been true with public health. Um, it, it, you know, if you look at the history of public health and the different infectious diseases that, that it's, it's trying to control, you want to balance individual freedoms with what's good for the collective. And, and we've, we've been lucky, too, in Wyandotte County that we've had a close relationship between the public health department, our leadership group, and, and the county commissioners and, and the mayors. We have a new mayor, Mayor Garner. And we're always trying to work with them to, to figure out what, what's the right balance and, and how to get the buy-in of the population for, for some of these things. Just, again, it's, it's about protecting the community, protecting our, our hospitals and, and these, these burnout nurses that are working here in the ER like we saw earlier or up in the ICUs. It's, it's, you know, we've got we've to come together on some of that. So we're always trying to work, work closely with them, and, and we want to keep doing that. And, and we, have to, we have to have that. We have to have... We have to have close working relationships with, go with governing officials. Well, and you're right. You're the voice of your people and, and these healthcare workers as well. So thank you for sharing all that you see and all that you know. Let's get to some community questions today. We've got some good ones. Peggy wants to know, how do you encourage people who are vaccinated and have had COVID to continue to wear masks? Or do you? Is that an important factor? Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things to say about that. The first is, is that we know that still, even people who have had vaccination, even people that are boosted are, can be infected with Omicron. And they may have very mild symptoms, maybe not even any symptoms. So remember that the whole point of wearing the mask is to protect your family members, your neighbors, your colleagues. So it's not about you at that point. It's about the other people around you. Even if you, if you have a mild uh, a case of, of, of uh, COVID or Omicron, you may not know that if you've been boosted. So it's important for you to wear that mask so that you don't unknowingly pass that on to somebody else. Donna has a question. Dr. LeMaster, don't you think that there are some people who will actually follow a mandate if it is in place, and if it is not, they don't wear a mask anyway? Isn't getting that group to mask important enough to put a mask mandate in place, like a force? Yeah. Well, we've, of course, had that conversation at the county commissioner level, and the general uh, response back to that is, if it's possible to do that, then it certainly seems to be an advisable thing to do, but you also have got to take into account um, how are you going to make that work. We talked about this already, the whole enforcement part of that. I think the other piece of that is that we've seen sufficient um, resistance on the part of, of, popul of the population that doesn't want a mask. Mm -hmm. 
so that when we put mandates into place, sometimes we end up getting a reaction to that among those who don't want a mask, which, it, which makes things even more dangerous. So then, then you start having people intentionally going into situations because they can, uh, you know. Is this where you bang your head against the wall? Yeah, <laughs> like, you can. I think that's right. I not, think that that's right. That is tough. Okay, I, I just like this conversation because I don't think, people think it's just, the situation is different than it was last time when we first put the mandates in yeah. and there was no vaccine and then you lift the mandates. It's, that is, it feels like a whole new element. It's yeah. very different. Yeah, it's interesting, these these surges and what we're, what we're learning and what we're not learning. You know, we obviously probably could have learned more before Delta, that surge. We probably could have learned more before this surge, before Omicron. We're probably gonna have another surge, mm -hmm. right, down down the line. So I think, and, and, we, what, and the other thing we've learned, which is a hopeful thing, is that these vaccines work yes. and the boosters work. And, and we, we don't have these variants escaping that immunity that the vaccines create. So how in the next couple of months, if we have time before the next variant arrives, how can we get yeah. more shots in arms? I think we, yes. we, we, we're not even learning the lessons that are simple common I, sense. So you're saying when these surges hit, it's like try to, again, reach the unreachable, get them yeah. so that they're prepped for the next surge yeah. 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 and so on and so forth down the road. Yep. Okay, uh, Lesko has a question, and Dr. Lamaster, I think you said this, that there are just going to be some people who don't get it, uh, the COVID shot. Yeah, um, okay. At what point do we just decide to respect their decision and trust the vaccine keeps those who do get it safe? I'd like to hear from both of you. Yeah, I mean, I think that we continue to push forward into, uh, into trying to get as many people vaccinated as we possibly can and, as, uh, and really who will. Um, I think what that sort of question is suggesting is that each person makes their own um, mind up and if they choose not to get vaccinated then they're not protected and they put themselves at risk. But it's not just, remember that vaccination is not just about your individual risk, it's about the entire community. The more people who are vaccinated, the closer we get to a place where where Omicron or the next variant that comes down the, 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 the pike can't replicate, can't transmit as quickly. Uh, if we want, we've talked about herd immunity from the very beginning. Uh, vaccination is not just about you, it's also about the community, it's about your neighbors, it's about your family. So that's sometimes the hard message that's to the get, hard message, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, and historically, especially with childhood vaccinations, which Again, if you look over the last 50 years, the dramatic impact of childhood immunizations has been massive in our, in our country and really ac across the globe. I'm sure Dr. Lamaster, like me, we remember more kids in the hospital when we were early in our careers than we've had the last 15 years because the vaccines, are, they work so well. But you do need that herd immunity, and I think they, they, that works somewhat with measles uh, and, and pneumococcal vaccines. But we found with the Delta and, and Omicron variants, it's it's a huge number to get to herd immunity now, higher yes. than I think we any of us expected yes. early on in the pandemic. And so again, it's about it's about protecting your neighbor. It's like running stoplights, right? If we have five percent of the population that just goes, I'm going to run all the stoplights because I don't want to stop and I'm in a hurry. There's going to be a lot of fatalities lot of on the streets, and people don't do that. They five percent of our population does not run all the stoplights mm -hmm. so we've got to figure out how to get some really high number like that with this going forward to to get this to go away and that's got to be both both in the u.s and internationally or we're yes. going to have more mutations Absolutely. and we do we get this the herd immunity question is asked almost daily what's your mm -hmm. insight on that dr lamaster well i agree with dr greiner i think that the the, the issue that we need to begin to think about much more. Remember that the current Omicron came out of a situation where, from a country where it didn't have the kind of vaccination coverage that we do. Uh, global vaccination, pushing the global vaccination agenda is an extremely important thing for us to do in this country. I think the other thing you know to remember is that we're fighting now against um, a, a sizable part of the population that doesn't trust in science. I remember as a kid lining up in a park uh, a line a mile long to get my polio sugar cube, right? My uh, mother told me that exact same question. She said, she said we would line up around yes, buildings. Nobody yeah. even asked a question. We just ran we out just and got did it. it. We just did it. And because there was a trust in science at mm -hmm. that point, uh, we've lost a lot of that uh, confidence in science uh, over the last few years. And, and, and so we're fighting uphill against that. Nonetheless, we have to continue to press forward 
uh, in every way we can. And a lot of that, I think, depends on, it, it's kind of what we're working on. We're, Dr. Greiner and I are working in a project uh, right now where we're looking at many different means of communication, of messaging, of trying to understand where people's perspectives are so that we can reach them and that they might be willing to change their mind. There's a lot of people still kind of sitting on the, on the fence about it, you know, who haven't quite made up their mind that they will never get it. And that's the group of people we need to reach. Well, and again, I go back to the, there's the scientific part of it, and then there's the, the, the mental, psychological part of it, really getting to understand somebody personally where they're coming from on the inside and, yeah. and their experiences. Everybody has a different experience yep. that gets them to the, I used to say all the time, I go, it's nice that I get to sit here on a desk with all these smart doctors surrounding me and I get all my questions answered. So it was no problem for me to go do it or to go take my children to do it. Yeah. But that's not fair when I have friends who have children who love their children the way I do, yeah. but they don't have they don't have that advantage. So, right. and I can't imagine how, I know there is, again, the unreachable. Yep. Um, Donna has a question. How concerned are both of you uh, about the legislative and political attacks on the public health system, the authorities, that kind of fight, the fighting the good fight in Kansas and Missouri? Why would anyone want to work in public health if they have no tools and, and no one's listening? And how how damaging could this be for, for healthcare overall down the road, what, certainly when it comes to workers? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a major concern. We t we've talked already about burnout nurses and, and nursing staff and hospital staff, respiratory therapists, who have struggled through this whole pandemic and are really hurting right now. And their families are hurting, right? But the same is true in public health. I'm, sh I'm sure you're seeing it too. We've got, especially our staff that have been there through the whole pandemic, our, our lead epidemiologist, Elizabeth Gronway, she is phenomenal, but she is fried at this mm -hmm. point. She's emotionally labile, and we're all trying to support each other because, because those attacks have, have continued to roll in. And, and it's, 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 an, you know, it's amazingly hard to keep doing your job when you know many people doubt it. And you're you're just trying to help people, you know. It, these aren't high-paying jobs <laughs> it, it, we're, we're talking about here. So we we've got to we've got to support public health for the long term and, and figure that out too. I don't know exactly what the answer is, but but some of it I think is you know is about just saying that this is this is a helping profession. It's very similar to healthcare. I have another question I want to ask you before we get to some final thoughts. But Dr. Hawkinson, Victor yeah. wants to know he's tested positive for COVID. When should he get another test? to say that he's negative. Do you need to do that? Do you need a test to say you're negative or do you just wait out the, the time period? We would just wait out the time period. There's not a recommendation to really test negative uh, for that. That's been fairly consistent through the pandemic. One of the things that has been consistent through the pandemic is we really don't need to retest, you know, after a certain amount of days. And some of that may depend on, on what your county or your state health department is saying it's okay to do. Obviously we know there's CDC rules but I think if you're waiting a number of days, certainly if it's more than seven days, you're really not going to be infectious and, and it'd be okay. But overall, the guidance is to not test. And Marie wants to know, she's, she's vaccinated and she's boosted, but she says she's on day 15 of a low-grade fever and headache. Is this common with COVID? She said she just doesn't feel right. Hmm. Is that pretty normal? Um, you know, I think this is an individual health issue and we should probably... Uh, have you go see a, a provider and just look in to see what all is going on, get the pertinent details uh, that we aren't able to get right now and do an exam and, and kind of come up with an assessment at that point. Typically, especially if you're boosted, uh, you're vaccinated, boosted, you probably shouldn't be having fever still at day 15, but obviously we know this virus is tricky and uh, some people do have more atypical symptoms as well, but just to make sure it's not something different, probably just go get evaluated. All right, Dr. Greiner, you had mentioned something I was asking you before we started the show, just, you know, what are you seeing with your um, patients, you know, your other job, what you care for, for folks? Um, and you said, the first thing you said, you said mental health is still a big issue. You said that's really never gone away. What made you bring that up? I, I think just how much we've we've seen it in, in the primary care environment. So Dr. Lamask and I are both family docs when we're, when we're doing our work here. And we, we have to think about everything that's going on with the patient, whether it's, you know, whether it's COVID related or it's their diabetes or it's, it's an anxiety issue or a depression issue. I just, I can't tell you the number of people that have had major anxiety problems throughout this pandemic. It, it really didn't start till about the summer of 2020. I think those early months, people were kind of like, 
you know, we're all struggling through this together. But then it just seemed like it's been a wave and, and, way, and, and then worse waves, right, with these variants. And I think this winter we've seen it again in the last month or two, so many anxiety issues, depression issues. People have, have trouble doing the healthy things that are going to, you know, you know, allow them to cope with that, like exercise or do mm-hmm. other things like that. And, and so we have to try to address those issues, too. Uh-huh. Yeah. They come in wanting to feel good with the body, and then you find yourself, Dr. LeMaster, having to kind of walk them through all these other issues in their life, right? Well, absolutely. That's right. On the other hand, I think that it's important to remember, um, you know, we get a lot of comments about how the masks are somehow contributing to all of that. I think that it's important to remember that, that the most important thing that you have around you are the people that you're in contact with, your close relationships and building up that those interpersonal relationships as much as you can. Uh, we get a tremendous amount of support from those with whom we're in daily contact and with whom we've got close relationships. So being able to draw on those uh, resources that we have is important. And there are many things that you can do. You know, you may not be able to sometime go to the gym to work out, but there are things that you can do at home uh, to, to stay active. Um, and, and, and we can always eat right, you know, and get enough sleep. Those are all things that are important for and that us we to can, do. Those are the things we can control. Those are the things we can Little control. Things. That's right. I think sometimes people um, are sort of um, anxious about or concerned about those things which are, are, are out of their control, but there are some things that are in your control, and those are things that you need to pay attention to and do. And they matter. Loved having you guys here today. So I want to... Um, Get some final thoughts from you. Uh, share with us anything that we didn't cover that you want everyone to know. Just give us some final thoughts, uh, Dr. Lemaster, and I'll start with you. Well, I think that the main thing that I would probably want to encourage people to say, you know, we've said it several times through here. If you haven't been boosted, go and get boosted now. Do it today. Uh, this is the most important thing, uh, I think, probably to, to, as a takeaway. I think the other thing to say is stay in contact, close contact with your primary care doctor and with uh, with your clinic. If you have any needs, um, make sure and reach out. That's your best source of first source of uh, Mm -hmm. getting information and getting uh, help if you need that. Uh, And we are going to be here with you uh, no matter what happens going forward through this. You have a very calming voice. And how great would it be if somebody heard you say, just go get boosted today. We got one person boosted for watching the show. We always say it's one show at a time, one person at a time, one day at a time. So we'll take it. That's a win. Dr. Greiner, your thoughts? Well, one of the things I was going to say was the same thing, because I know many of us have had this experience. When people are in the office, we oftentimes can get people to, to take that initial vaccination or that booster when they've been very resistant to it otherwise. And, and I've had some amazing experiences like that in the office. It's just a better environment. So, yeah. so I said, I don't know, a year ago or something, I said, we should make this the year of see your doctor twice. Don't just get your annual physical. Maybe this should be the year where we just, we just have a campaign that's like, let's get everybody to see their, their, their primary care physician two times instead of just that annual physical, because that might open up opportunities to address these mental health concerns we're talking about, address vaccination, whether you're boosted, whether you've got some other under, underlying complications that, that need to be tuned up to keep you healthy, whether, whether you need to talk about these self-care things uh-huh. like, like Dr. LeMaster's talking about sleep and exercise and drinking a little less, because yeah. we've had a, a pandemic wave of substance abuse too. Yeah. So, so I, I'm kind of thinking maybe 2022 is the, is the year of, of stay in touch with your primary care physician and think about seeing them an extra time this Build year. Build that relationship, and if you don't get them on the first time, answer some questions, and maybe the next time they come back, you've got a fully vaxxed and boosted patient, yeah. you know, yeah. ready to go. Thank yeah. you both so much. We appreciate you always. Dr. Hawkinson, yeah. final thoughts today. I would just like to thank our public health officials. You know, we have two great doctors here who are looking out not only for their individual patients, but for the community as a whole, and I think they brought up a good point that a lot of public health officials have been pushed out or burned out for one reason or another. We know there is a myopia uh, in leadership to try and handcuff the ability for for us to do public health and have public health guidance and um, and put out the, the best optimal public health guidance to keep everybody safe. Um, you know, it's those same people that are standing on the giants of shoulders and decades upon decades of public health science and medicine that has come before them, that has allowed them to continue to be healthy, have even things like clean drinking water and overall decreased disease 
rates. So I think it's important to understand that and you know hopefully uh, public health will turn around and we can keep all of those people that have dedicated their time and their lives to staying in that profession to help keep those communities safe. Thanks, Dr. Hawkinson, and thank you all for being with us today. Don't forget, you can catch our shows anytime by logging on to our Facebook or our YouTube page. Coming up tomorrow, there is definitely a right and a wrong way to wear your mask. Amanda Kackler is back. She's going to show us how to do it right. Plus, Dr. Tim Williamson with what our COVID numbers are telling us about this stage of the pandemic and what's coming up next in the next following weeks. So everyone have a fantastic Thursday, and we will see you back here tomorrow at 8. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.